started. Um, my name is Lucy Herman. I'm the program director for the Law and Policy Lab. Many of you are in Policy Lab practicums. I recognize a few of you. Some of you are coming from the GSD program and from the Skills program. And we're really lucky to have all of you here to engage Professor Donahue in a robust discussion about the use of data in law, economics, and public policy. Um, Professor Donahue has made a reputation, a career, out of using hard data to move public policy, to change law, to shift the thinking of judges. Um, he'll tell you a little bit about some of his work across the different sectors. He's um, got quite a robust um, career behind him. Uh, and the thing that is uh, important for me to say is that when I first came here, I knew that uh, Stanford Law had a reputation for uh, empirical, empirically driven law, public policy, that kind of thinking. And he was first and foremost um, among the thinkers that make the reputation of the school what it is. So we are really fortunate to come out here today to talk to us a little bit about our own work, this work, and to inspire you to move on with your own work in the Thank you so much for this generous introduction. Great to be with you. Today is sort of a Special day. And does anyone know what happened four years ago today, February 13th, 2016? People just don't know these things anymore. <laughs> Justice Antonin Scalia died uh, four years ago today, and it's particularly fitting that I would speak about guns abortion and the death penalty on the day that he died, because of course these were very critical uh, elements of his own thinking. On the, on the other hand, I was on the other side of every one of those issues from Antonin Scalia. And it's also an interesting moment because uh, we do have one justice who is rather infirm and sickly, and if she were to die uh, from this day forward, it will be interesting to see if Mitch McConnell resurrects the idea that you can't appoint a new justice uh, in the year of an election prior to uh, the voters decide. Okay, uh, so my goal has been to follow the goal of the Enlightenment to encourage the use of science and systematic uh, evaluation of evidence to improve uh, human existence. Uh, and as a result, ideology and plea to authority are sort of my bete noirs. And that's one reason why I'm not a particular fan of Justice Scalia, because ideology and pleas to authority were pretty much the core of his uh, public policy existence. Um, so I've done a great deal of empirical work on guns, abortion, and death penalty. I'll try to talk about, a little bit about this. Ordinarily, I would just spend you know, two hours on one of these topics, so I'm going to really just give you a, a little bit of a taste of different things, just so you can see how we brought evidence to bear in some legal and or policy debate. I start off with this graph because it underscores how how out of touch with reality most Americans are uh, on issues about crime. So this uh, lower line, green line, shows the drop in violent crime uh, from about 1992 uh, down. Essentially, the eight years of the Clinton administration were an enormous period of uh, improving uh, crime statistics. Uh, but you see, at some point, the number of people who think that crime is going up in the last year starts really rising. Um, and even after uh, you know, five years of the greatest drop in crime in American history, still the majority of Americans thought crime had risen in the last year. Now, why does this happen? In part because so much of media and politicians and certain business interests have an incentive to mislead you on crime. And so it's very hard for people to learn anything, but if people are actually trying to tell you the wrong thing constantly, it really becomes uh, impossible. And so just to give you a sense of this, uh, this was uh, President Trump right before the election. If you won't hear this from the media, we have the highest voter rate in this country in 45 years. You won't hear that from these people who don't want to talk about it. The highest voter rate in 45 years. Now, the reason the media didn't talk about it was, of course, it wasn't at all true, but uh, Trump continued on. So even after he won the election, there was no need to lie anymore. He invited sheriffs from around the country 
And he repeated it. He even made it a little stronger, not only 45 years, but 47 years. <laughs> and he'd say, I used to say that. I'd say that in a speech. And everybody was surprised because the press doesn't tell it like it is. It wasn't to their advantage to say that. But the murder rate is the highest it's been in, I guess, from 45 to 47 years. So, of course, completely wrong. Uh, but the sheriff sat there like a bump on a log saying, you know, thank God we have someone like you instead of this, this sloucher that we had for the last eight years, uh, somebody to really tell the truth. I couldn't tell whether the sheriffs didn't know that crime had dropped or they just didn't see it. Um, but this is dangerous stuff. So we have Dylan Roof in June of 2015 killing nine black worshipers at a church in South Carolina. A couple of months later, Trump tweets, uh, fake racist news that was consistent with the uh, Dylan Roof explanation. When he faced the death sentence, he said, you know, I, I can't apologize because somebody had to do it. Black people are killing white people every day. What I did is so minuscule compared to what they do to white people every day. So I still feel I have to do it. And this is what Trump tweeted. And it said that uh, whites killed by blacks, 81% of whites who were murdered are killed by blacks, according to this tweet. Um, and it says that the source is Crime Statistics Bureau of San Francisco. There is no Crime Statistics Bureau of San Francisco. <laughs> Those numbers are completely wrong. In general, whites kill whites and blacks kill blacks. Um, but this is the sort of dangerous stuff that President Trump tweets out. Uh, and he was actually confronted about it by Bill O'Reilly. And he said, oh, I retweeted some, somebody that was supposedly an expert. Am I going to check every statistic? Um, but of course, it's more than that. You know, th these tropes are very much to his political advantage. And I do think when you lie at the level that the president has done, and truth is really the heart of democracy, uh, this is something that he, I think of as even rising to the level of high crimes and misdemeanor if you're constantly uh, demeaning the truth, undermining the truth, and especially with racist uh, overtones. Okay, so talk about the death penalty for a second. Now, what are the important empirical questions about the death penalty? What comes to mind? Just one at a time, please. Okay. Whether it defers other murders? Yeah, so deterrence is, of course, one of the most important things. Anything else back to mind? Is uh, whether it's cheaper than life imprisonment, perhaps? Yeah, so, so that would be an, another question that you could look at empirically. Any, anything else we'd be interested in? Racial dis disproportionality. Yeah, yeah. So I spent years of my life first on the deterrence question, then on the the monetary issues, and, and then on racial disparities. So you, you, you hit the trifecta of my work. Uh, so let's spend some time looking at these issues. Uh, the Wall Street Journal was confronted with a situation the Supreme Court had just granted cert in a lethal injection case. And so they wanted to sort of poison the public and potentially influence uh, Supreme Court justices with misinformation about the death penalty. So they asked two people, uh, and then Dwight Adler and Michael Summers to write uh, an op-ed piece. And the conclusion was, uh, based on a National Time Series study, uh, every execution saves 74 lives. Of course, it's a preposterous claim, but these are the sort of things that, you know, the Wall Street Journal is considered one of the most elite, you know, uh, news media institutions. They could have asked any expert in the country, uh, and this is the study. And what it shows is, this is the number of murders. They fell from 25,000 in 1992 down to about 15,000. So that's good. Every year we were saving 10,000 lives by reducing the murder rate. And they claim that it's this jump in the number of executions that explains that. So this is what I consider the bad use of empirical evidence. Uh, the, the, the Greek notion of rhetoric was that you're supposed to try to persuade people to understand and believe the truth. The bad notion of rhetoric, which is inconsistent with the Greek ideal, is when you use evidence to persuade people of something that's wrong. And so this is the perfect example of the bad use of rhetoric. Uh, and why did the Wall Street Journal turn to these two people? One was a marketing professor, the other was a management professor. They were both rather long in the tooth. 
and had never written anything on any death penalty or even crime issue. But it was all just part of essentially this how do we manipulate the, the public with misinformation effort. And then they brought in ABC to vouch for it. So ABC says, uh, a new study is adding to the long-running debate. Researchers in Southern California claims it deters. And then they bring in somebody, Tony Ribera from the Institute of Criminal Justice. As far as the study itself goes, the research, design, analysis, interpretation, they all appear to be valid. Uh, now, what was the research design? All it was was that one picture I showed you. There was nothing else. It was just crime had gone down and, you know, death penalty had, uh, had gone up over that period. But there are literally thousands of things that you could have drawn on the graph that were going up in that, in that period. Uh, so to say that there was a causal nexus between those two is really quite extreme, and yet here we get uh, a number of institutions coming together to vouch for this. Uh, interestingly, when it came out, me and a few others wrote a pretty strong condemning uh, piece about this particular study, and uh, I love the, the ending here. The authors initially agreed to speak with ABC News, but later reviewed saying their study speaks for itself. Um, the study did speak for itself, but it said some very bad things, and it was never published, of course, because it was really garbage. Uh, so, um, just to give you a sense of what would be a better way to look at data, let's see if we uh, looked at data a little bit more sensibly. So this is actually the pattern of murders, and the murder rate in Canada, and this is the pattern of the murder rate in the United States. So interestingly, you see that they follow very similar patterns. So there are some fixed effects that seem to operate on both the United States and Canada, although Canada has a much, much lower murder rate. We even have to use a different scale because it's one third the size of the scale that we use for uh, putting on the American murder rate. Um, so that's interesting in itself, that whatever drives murder in the U.S. has a similar impact. And so you see that Canada got rid of their death penalty here, and, and there was a subsequent increase in the murder rate. But the U.S. got rid of it years later, and you see that the patterns don't match up. As though it, whatever's happening in Canada and the U.S., it's moving, but it's not correlating with a change in the death penalty. And of course, we see that they both got a drop in crime at the period that the Wall Street Journal said it was being generated by the increase in the death penalty, but Canada did not bring back the death penalty. So they were getting the drop. And indeed, the, uh, the change in the murder rate for the two countries was quite similar. Uh, the murder rate fell by 39% in the US, 34% in Canada. And the U.S. had an enormous increase in incarceration, an enormous increase in the number of police, as well as this sort of modest increase in the death penalty. And the idea that you would then attribute uh, all of that change, the, the 10,000 lives saved, to the death penalty really was extreme. But that's, how, that's what the, uh, the study did to try to make it seem like the death penalty was a big deterrent. Another way to do a comparison. And what I'm trying to do is, is do a little bit more of a treatment and control assessment is here is the, uh, the death penalty rate for the states that never had a death penalty in the United States over any period. You know? So some states like Minnesota, Wisconsin, you know, got rid of the death penalty you know, 100 years ago uh, or more. And uh, so nothing was changing with the death penalty in these states, either at that point or at that point. And you see that they still get the same pattern of the increase in crime and the drop for the other states. So again, it undermines the causal claim about the death penalty having any, any impact. But what happened with the Supreme Court case? The Supreme Court case cited the Wall Street Journal study as evidence that uh, the death penalty was a deterrent. And that's what the special interests were trying to do, get dishonest and, and inaccurate evidence before the court. 
and the courts weren't adept enough to know. Uh, although I should say, uh, Justice Scalia, who was quite a recidivist in this domain, uh, had initially cited a, a paper um, that the author of the paper then said, no, Justice Scalia has it wrong, and then he cited it again in the next death penalty case as evidence of deterrence. So, uh, Scalia really didn't care. He had his beliefs, and he was going to cite whatever supported that belief. Yeah. Did Tony Rivera repeatedly engage in that debate, or was it just this one-off ABC News thing? That, that's the only time I've ever seen that. Okay. So just Google my bad idea of what a cranky is. Yeah. A 75-year-old assistant professor who was the police chief, known for his hair trigger temper and aggressive my way or the highway approach. <laughs> just the right person to verify the thing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, he, he was a, a police officer, not, a, uh, not an academic. Okay, so let's jump to arbitrariness and, and discrimination. This is what the Supreme Court said. The culpability of the average murderer is insufficient to justify the most extreme sanction available to the state. Uh, within the category of capital crimes, the death penalty must be reserved for the worst of the worst offenses. Now, whenever I see that, I try to say, well, can we actually figure out what are the worst offenses? And one study I did, I was asked to do a big evaluation of the Connecticut death penalty, was to try to come up with metrics uh, asking people, how do you rate these cases? And it turns out um, people rate the egregiousness of crimes quite similarly. They may vary a lot on what they think the sentence should be, but if you show people two crimes, they say, oh yeah, that one's worse than this one. Uh, and we rated all of the 205 death eligible cases that occurred in the state of Connecticut over this period. And you can see that the ones that got the death penalty were the ones that were these darkened red boxes. And you would think that if it was being limited to the worst of the worst offenses, all of the cases would aggregate way up on this end, this being the highest level of egregiousness. Uh, I should say, uh, I would have liked to have made this slide, but the New York Times did it. Uh, they, they, they took my data, and they're, they're better at graphics than I am, so I used their slide instead of my own. Uh, but it does show that only one of the 32 worst <coughs> cases resulted in the death row conviction. So you might wonder, well, what is it about these cases that leads them to get the death penalty? And that's what I spent uh, eight years of my life doing. Yeah. I was wondering how they partition the data. Do they exclude the next row because there's three death row convictions there? Or what, does, what makes the cases from eight? No, what is it? So each one of these, five. there are 205 boxes here. Each one of these is a different case. Uh -huh. And we evaluated them on a scale by asking people, you know, how egregious do you find this case? These are the most egregious. These are the least egregious. And you can see there's sort of a bell-shaped curve of how horrible a death-eligible crime is. But these are the only ones that got a death sentence. All the others got some other sentence, not a sentence. Yeah, why was sentence. the cutoff at nine point something? Say so again? Why, why, why was the cutoff at nine point something of the worst state credit crime? Oh. Oh, you know, they, they basically just, that was the New York Times saying, we just looked at the worst 32, and there was only one in that. Obviously, if they'd gone one step further, there were yeah. three cases there. So they were trying to make the strongest argument. Mm -hmm. Just uh, methodologically, how, how was this question asked? Was it on a Likert scale? Was it free response? And sort of did you, if you presented it differently, did you see a different level of egregiousness? And then would that convert into more or less convictions based on yeah. just how you presented the question? Yeah, no, it's great, a great, uh, great question. And there, I hadn't realized this when I first went down this path, but there is an enormous amount of research on exactly this question. and. Uh, and people do it in different ways. And so this particular graph was done where we actually asked people on four different issues, rate right from one to three, how bad this case was on this particular question. And we just added up the, the answers to those four questions. But we also asked slightly different question, just on a one to five scale, how egregious is this crime? 
And the results are dramatically identical, as I'll show you in one second. So that was comforting, that different scales of egregiousness. And it turns out that uh, uh, the literature has come to the conclusion that people are quite good at evaluating egregiousness, and that the people who are best at doing it are well-educated young individuals who have incorporated the society's sense of what is egregiousness. And those are the people that I was using in my analysis. But I'll say more about this in one second. Um, so essentially, we then tried to do a regression analysis that tried to explain what are the factors that led to any individual case getting at that sentence. We threw in all this uh, information, and we had three different measures of egregiousness, as, as I mentioned. Two of them were just asking individuals uh, you know, about the nature of the case to evaluate it on certain metrics. And one was that we had these very elaborate um, uh, uh, data collection enterprises, and one of them was just to check off all of the factors that someone might deem to be egregious, like, you know, did you shoot the person in the head? Did you rape them? Did you do all of these horrible things to them? And we just made a count of how many of those items were identified for any particular case. It turned out that that was actually a, a fairly important metric for capturing egregiousness. OK, so when we did the analysis, um, oh, I, I skipped over my box here. OK, yeah, there it is. So essentially what we did was we divided into four categories, minorities killing whites, minorities killing minorities, white killing whites, and white killing minority. And then the dark and black area tells you which case got treated the most harshly of those four different <coughs> categories. And you can see when it comes down to charging you, in other words, seeking uh, to get uh, a possible death penalty by charging you with a capital felony, uh, minorities killing whites were treated most harshly. 85% of the time, if it was a death eligible case, they went for capital felony, uh, much lower than the other three categories. And similarly, in terms of being sentenced to death, 12% uh, of the time, minority killing, killing whites got a sentence of death, but the other three categories much lower. Uh, so uh, that is what drove the results. And then we did a, a regression analysis trying to control for these various factors. And uh, uh, it did not change the results. So here you see uh, essentially um, you know, a 27% higher percentage point higher likelihood of being capitally charged. And you see almost the exact result whether we use that 4 to 12 egregiousness measure or simply this 1 to 5, just to ask people how egregious do you think it is on a 1 to 5 scale without trying to put it into categories. Almost identical results using those two measures. And we, we you know, obviously the state came back at us. They, they hired a uh, crank expert witness, paid him $1.5 million to attack me. Um, and we took in all of the suggestions that he made, and yet you see very little change in those substantial differentiations in capital charging rates. Unfortunately, we lost in the trial court. Uh, the, the, the judge found that there were, um, a, that what we considered enormous and unexplained geographic disparities was an innocuous coincidence. Uh, we found that the death sentences are not confined to the worst murders. The judge ignored that. We found there was gender bias in sentencing. The judge said there was no evidence, even though his experts said that there was. Uh, we found there was racial bias in charging. The judge ignored that. And uh, uh, we found that there was arbitrariness, uh, and the judge said no. Uh, so this is uh, his conclusion, Judge Ferraza. When I read this to Rick Banks, he said, I do not believe any federal judge or, or any judge in, in America, this was a state court judge, could say this, but this is what he said. Donahue's results found statistically significant deviation from the expected value only in the situation of a black perpetrator who was convicted of murdering a white victim. Donahue testified this divergence probably reflects the tendencies of members of the majority to be more empathetic 
to majority victims and less sympathetic to the minority perpetrators with whom they identify the least. The court concurs that this explanation is the most likely, but this explanation stems from a psychological phenomenon rather than some flaw created by the legal system and thus has no bearing on the constitutionality of Connecticut's death penalty system. Luckily, we won on appeal in the Connecticut Supreme Court, and I love the fact that the, uh, the judge was sort of dressed down when uh, the state court, uh, the, the state Supreme Court said the fact that a white prosecutor or a white juror may be more troubled by the death of a white victim uh, may be explicable, but it is not morally defensible, and it should not be the basis on which we decide who lives and who dies. Um, so. Uh, uh, Luckily, the empirical work that we put together really influenced the court, or at least they articulated it. They noted the fact that Santiago, who was a minority uh, convicted for killing a white, had the least egregious of all of the death sentencing cases and less egregious than you know, 117 of the 205 cases. Um, and again, the language that the court used often mimics what an empiricist would be most interested in. The court said in Atkins versus Virginia, unless the imposition of the death penalty measurably contributes to either deterrence or uh, retribution, and it's nothing more than the purposeless and needless imposition of pain. And so that's what we tried to do in this work, is try to see, you know, is there deterrence? Uh, and is there uh, you know, appropriate uh, and accurate sentencing based on this notion that the worst offenders should be treated most harshly and race should not play a role. And so I was gratified that in Glossop versus Gross, Justice Breyer uh, strongly uh, endorsed uh, the work on the deterrent studies that uh, I did with my very talented co-author Justin Walters. Uh, and then um, uh, focused on the, the Connecticut death penalty case. And Breyer cited this study and uh, you know, sort of endorsed its conclusion. But Justice Th Thomas came back at him and you know, said, oh, these are studied by death penalty abolitionists, and you should ignore those. Uh, and he said the, the Donahue study on which Justice Breyer relies most heavily measured egregiousness. Uh, and he said, this exercise in some ways approximates the function performed by jurors. But then he goes on to say, you should ignore it because um, these, uh, these raiders you know, didn't sit through days and days of testimony, hearing you know, the horrible details of the murder and so on and so forth. But what Thomas didn't understand is, it re and he said, all the cases that I see clearly deserve the death penalty, so, you know, Donahue's not, you know, this is nonsense. But he doesn't understand that, let's say that, you know, all of these cases are truly horrible, and they are, if you only gave the death penalty to minorities who killed whites, then you'd be seeing a lot of horrible cases. But if you just said, well, you know, every case I looked at looks horrible, uh, you really need to do a, an evaluation to see, well, what about the other cases that aren't getting the death penalty, and how do those line up? And it turns out that most cases, as we've seen, um, don't get to a jury, because a big decision that is made is the prosecutors are deciding who to charge with a capital felony. And so you need to look at this broader uh, set of data than just looking at what happens uh, in the final determination. I, I don't think. Thomas ever quite understood that, um, and, and that's what my work was trying to do. Uh, and then he tried to dismiss uh, the racial finding. He said uh, the primary explanation in the dying regression was uh, uh, not race or sex, but the locality. And it is true that you know where the case occurred had an enormous impact because some prosecutors were pro death penalty, but. The second most important factor was race. And for him to say, oh, you know, it's, it's all geography, when race was the second uh, most important factor, more important than egregiousness and many other items that you thought would be legitimate factors, I thought was somewhat dishonest. Now, for many years in Texas, 
there was a great debate about whether the state should introduce life without possibility of parole as an option in capital cases. So what were the arguments for and against? It turns out one of the biggest arguments against allowing life without possibility of parole as a possible sentence was that the pro-death penalty people were afraid, we don't want that because jurors might be lenient. Uh, so ordinarily, People, you know, in Europe, for example, life without possibility is a prohibited sentence. It's inconsistent with humane values according to the European Union. But in, the, in Texas, it was thought to be, you know, too merciful because uh, people would opt for that rather than the death penalty. And they were right, but in a troubling way. So in 2005, they adopted life without possibility of parole. And um, the great lawyer, uh, Sherry, you want to raise your hand back there? Uh, if, if people uh, followed the Curtis Flowers uh, death penalty case argued in June in the U.S. Supreme Court, Cherry was the lawyer for Curtis Flowers, won that case. An amazing case. If you haven't listened to In the Dark podcast season two, I recommend it highly. Uh, but in any event, uh, and, and the racial bias in that case was clearly off the charts. Uh, I mean, if you have any question of whether there's racial bias in Southern justice, uh, just listen to In the Dark podcast or read the, uh, the Supreme Court decision uh, in the Curtis Flowers case. But anyway, Sherry asked me to look at Texas, uh, specifically Harris County, and you see something very strange happens after one of the options for the jurors is life without possibility of parole, because now the only people who have been getting the death penalty in Harris County, Texas, are minorities who killed minorities and minorities who killed whites. You see none of the white defendants who killed minorities or white defendants who killed whites uh, got a, a death sentence over this period that uh, I collected the data for. And so we've been evaluating the data. Uh, also tried to see whether there were explanatory variables that are in the supplemental homicide data uh, that could identify why that uh, change happens. And again, highly statistically significant numbers uh, showing elevated rates of sentencing for minority on minority or minority on white cases. Strongest effect is on minority on white, so in that sense, similar to what we saw in Connecticut. Uh, so statistically significant after we control for everything that is in the current data set. Uh, and uh, there's still more work to be done. We're trying to collect uh, more data. But the initial empirical evaluation raises substantial concerns uh, that the death penalty is being administered in a racially discriminatory fashion in Harris County, Texas. So let me say a little bit about guns. Uh, that's the end of my death penalty discussion. Uh, and um, what is a right to carry law, RTC law? So these are laws that allow citizens, as a matter of right, to carry guns on their person outside the home. Uh, in the 1970s, all but five states had banned concealed carry or limited it to those having a special permit issued only to applications deemed to be particularly trustworthy. Uh, and, but the new right to carry laws are designed to eliminate government discretion, allow anyone to have them. And there's even been uh, a new development as states have moved to permitless carry, to say you don't even need to have a permit. Anyone who is not, according to the federal statute, a mental defective or a convicted felon uh, is allowed to carry guns in those permitless carry states. So this is, this is where we were in 1987. See all these red states here? These are states that prohibit carrying of, of guns completely. But by uh, you know, 2019, you can see uh, all of those states that were previously prohibiting now allow it. And the green states uh, don't have any restrictions. You don't need to even get a, a permit. So there are a handful of states that are trying to hold out and say, at least I've got a, a, a reason and show that you are uh, you know, a responsible citizen before you can get a permit. Uh, 
but this, there's a case before the Supreme Court trying to overturn that on Second Amendment grounds. So it's important to know what happens to crime when you adopt the right to carry law. And so obviously there, there's a potential good side of carrying guns and you can off criminals or deter crime. But there are also a lot of bad things that can happen. Misconduct by permit holders, road rage, a lot more gun thefts, that's a huge problem. Uh, more gun carrying by criminals in response and also burdens on the police. All of those can elevate crime. Just to give you a highlight of some of the things where cases went wrong in part because someone was carrying a gun with a permit to do so. Uh, I just took four cases from Florida. You've all heard of the George Zimmerman killing Trayvon Martin case. You may not have heard of Michael Dunn killing Jordan Davis for playing loud music at a gas station, rap music. Um, Jordan Davis's mom ran for uh, uh, political office and now is an elected official in Florida in response to that killing. Uh, Curtis Reeves uh, uh, killed a dad who was texting uh, the babysitter for his sick child who was home. Uh, and they started screaming at each other. And the dad threw popcorn at Curtis Reeves, who then killed him uh, in the movie theater. And uh, this is a more recent case where a guy was hassling a woman uh, who was in a car. Uh, she just let her boyfriend and uh, five-year-old son uh, run into the store while she was waiting in a disabled parking spot. And the guy was hassling her. Uh, boyfriend came out and uh, pushed the guy down on the ground. And the guy pulled out his gun and, and killed Marquise uh, McLaughlin. It was just uh, convicted for murder. Uh, another road rage case, uh, two Michigan drivers were driving down the road, they got angry with each other. They both had right to carry permits and were carrying. They pulled over, stepped out of their cars, and shot each other, so they both died uh, later that day. Sometimes people say, well, the number of revocations of permits are small. Those are two cases where uh, no permits were actually revoked, but they were both dead. So what does the evidence show? We've actually created a statistical model and what you see is that in the period prior to the adoption, our statistical model is working pretty well. We, we would expect that there would be no impact on crime prior to the adoption of the right to carry law if we uh, estimated our model correctly. But you see, right when the uh, law goes into effect, violent crime starts uh, elevating relative to the states that have not adopted uh, right to carry laws. And, uh, uh, this evidence uh, of the impact on violent crime is pretty robust and persuasive. Also did a similar sort of analysis for homicide, suggesting the murder rate rises by 9.4%. Uh, again, you see the same sort of pattern, uh, nothing before, and then the elevation starts at the time of the adoption of the right to carry law. That was called a panel data analysis. Uh, every type of statistical analysis has hopefully some strengths, but also some weaknesses. So some Harvard economists came up with a new technique called synthetic controls. And we went through that sort of analysis. And uh, it's sort of an interesting process where essentially what you're always trying to do in these evaluations is think of the counterfactual. What would have happened if the state had not adopted uh, a particular law? Uh, rather than just looking at what happens after they adopt. Because there could be so many things that are going on. Could be crime is trending down, uh, but it would have trended down a lot more sharply if the law had not adopted. Um, but that's what the synthetic control tries to do. It comes up with something that estimates the pattern of crime prior to adoption rather well. So you see we fit the pre uh, adoption data for Pennsylvania quite well. And then what happens when uh, the permit law allowing concealed carry was adopted in 1989, but only extended to Philadelphia in 1995. And that's when things went south for, for Philadelphia, that uh, crime uh, diverged very sharply from what we would have predicted and what actually happened. See a similar pattern with Texas. Crime was falling. But the dotted line tells us what the synthetic control estimate for what would have happened 
had the law uh, not been adopted. And the black line tells us what actually happened. So you can see that the uh, synthetic control estimates suggest a pretty significant drop in crime. And if you just look at the estimated effects, it mimics pretty closely what the panel data analysis shows. So we have two very different techniques uh, coming up with similar conclusions that crime is elevated, violent crime is elevated when these laws are adopted. And one interesting thing was that the uh, extent of the elevation in crime was uh, uh, positively related to the prevalence of guns in the jurisdiction. That's what this upward slope means. These are states that have higher prevalence of guns and therefore got higher increases in violent crime. Uh, interestingly, one of the explanatory factors seems to be that when citizens start carrying handguns, criminals start carrying handguns more often when they commit crime. So the number of armed robberies with guns rose pretty sharply after right to carry laws went into effect. And of course, that's not a good thing. It's sort of an arms race scenario. For explaining the synthetic control model, like you report what states you're using to create the synthetic controls, but how did how do you communicate effectively around when you're comparing Texas to California and Nebraska and Wisconsin? It's going to feel to somebody like those states aren't at all like Texas. Yep. How can we? Yep. How, how is this relevant? Yeah, 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 and and so. It's one reason why I like the fact that we, we have multiple uh, measures and multiple techniques. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, the, the nice thing about the synthetic controls is I wasn't making those selections. That is done by the, uh, the algorithm, which says what weighting of states in the pre-adoption period will best match the... Uh, the pre-treatment pattern of crime, and then just extrapolate it <coughs> forward. So it takes away the discretion element. But as you say, uh, you know, I'm not sure I believe that particular uh, measure. But we have it for the 33 states. And so you can look through the ones that you say, ah, I believe it here, I don't believe it here, uh, and throw away those that you don't believe. I mean, it's one of the nice things, I think, about the synthetic control measure because you it is very transparent what you have done and uh, I, I also went through and did a lot of robustness checks to see well if I don't believe that one throw it away does it does it alter the ultimate conclusion and it does tend to be a, a fairly robust conclusion uh, so again we're always trying to collect more data and people are working on ways to improve uh, the synthetic control methodology so things uh, over the course of my career in, in doing empirical work have, have constantly gotten better. Each new tool is, is sometimes oversold as we've finally gotten to the end of uh, perf perfect uh, empirical evaluation, but there's always room for improvement. Okay, and this just highlights the point that uh, uh, in the RTC states we've gotten this rise that now almost half of the robberies are committed with a firearm, while in the non-RTC states, it, it's trended down. Uh, so that is one of the advantages of not having a right to carry law. So I, I basically uh, summarize the right to carry findings as the panel data models support uh, increases in violent crime. The synthetic control models back that up. Um, but there is uh, more work to be done. Let me just say a little bit about the federal assault weapon ban. So the evidence here is in some ways harder to deal with because we don't have the benefit that we had in the right to carry states of some states adopting and other states not adopting. So you, you have a better chance for trying to create this treatment and control notion that I like. Uh, here all we have is uh, the, the, the law went into effect in 1994 and was taken <laughs> away in 2000. So we got, we got it turned on and turned off. And the interesting thing is that while violent crime was trending down over this whole period, this is the violent crime uh, line, uh, 
you do see that uh, mass shootings defined as six or more killed uh, in, in a particular shooting event uh, dropped pretty sharply during the federal assault weapon ban period and have been rising very sharply since. And so remember in the first slide when people were saying we think crime is rising, part of the reason that they think that is because we're seeing this very sharp increase in mass shootings and they got a lot of press and people tend to think that that is all of a violent crime, but, but it is just one small part of the violent crime story. Uh, you also see that during the 10 years of the federal assault weapon ban, there was a pretty substantial drop in the number of deaths per episode, uh, and uh, that has been rising very sharply. Those guns are becoming much more dangerous, and the number of high-capacity magazines, so you can shoot you know, 30, 50, or even 100 bullets without reloading, uh, makes it easier to kill a lot of people uh, very quickly. Uh, so there's been a 90% uh, increase in the number of people who die in every incident since the decade after elimination of the federal assault weapon ban. So the federal assault weapon ban would have helped all of the 15 gun massacres since 2014 were killed uh, and that led to 271 deaths. Those were all killed by weapons prohibited under the federal assault weapon ban. And you know, a recent shooting in Saugus High School uh, uh, was a case where a guy had six bullets in his gun, so he fired five of them and then killed himself with the sixth. It sort of underscores that if you have a high-capacity magazine, you can do a lot more damage than if you are unlimited. Um, and of course, the assault weapon uh, gun is so dramatically more dangerous than a musket in 1791 when the Second Amendment was adopted <laughs> that you really do need to have a different way of thinking about how we regulate assault weapons. Um, the NRA sent around a thing, a fake news alert, uh, responding to my piece on the New York Times saying that the assault weapon ban uh, did work. Um, but um, um, this is going to be an interesting case. And, uh, in fact, a uh, federal judge in California recently struck down California's restrictions on high-capacity magazines, and he now has before him the same federal trial court judge um, and assault weapon ban challenge. So I'm the expert witness in both of those cases. All right, my final topic. Do I have a few more minutes, or should I stop here? You've got a few minutes. Okay. Let me just say very briefly, and then I'll open it up, uh, that Steve Levitt and I, you've probably heard of Steve Levitt if you've ever read Freakonomics. Uh, uh, he was uh, one of the co-authors of that book. Uh, but uh, we uh, were trying to figure out why did crime fall so dramatically in the eight years of the Clinton administration. It really is one of the most remarkable socioeconomic events in you know, the last 100 years in the United States, this incredible drop of crime, as we saw from 25,000 murders a year to 15,000, saving 10,000 lives a year. It's pretty astonishing. There is no study that even comes close to explaining that magnitude of, of, of a change. And so we proposed about 20 years ago that the legalization of abortion may have played a role in that because uh, unwanted children have been shown in numerous studies to have much higher rates of uh, uh, crime and other bad outcomes. Uh, and indeed, in the Roe versus Wade decision, they talked about the distress for all concerned with uh, unwanted children and the problems that this would create in the family that was already unable psychologically and otherwise to care for more children. And this chart, I think, highlights why in the U.S. this is a particular issue, because what this graph just shows is a comparison between the U.S., Finland, Norway, and Sweden on child poverty rates after the welfare system and the tax and transfer system has operated based on whether it's a married family, a cohabiting family, single dad, single mom, or single mom living with others. Um, and you see, in every case, the child poverty rate in the U.S. is dramatically higher. And that, of course, is such an uh, impediment to good life outcomes 
did a, a, a study that literally just came out uh, you know, a few weeks ago, looked at women who went into an abortion clinic and were turned away because the gestation was beyond the limit that the abortion clinic allowed. And they compared what happened to those women who were denied the right to abortion with those who were just under the threshold. And they found it had enormous financial implications for those women, much harder going forward. And I do think that that is part of the burden that the uh, prohibition on abortion puts on uh, you know, poor women in the United States. Uh, so anyway, uh, we, we did that uh, piece back in 2001, uh, claimed that uh, legalization played a role. Uh, this was uh, you know, one of the emails uh, Steve writing to me, December 4th, 1998. On the abortion crime thing, do you have any real evidence to support your conjecture that abortion lowers crime? So that's what we spent the next couple of years doing. And one of our predictions in that paper was when a steady state is reached roughly 20 years from now, the impact of abortion will be roughly twice as great as the impact felt so far. Our results suggest that all else equal, legalized abortion will persistently uh, lead to crime reductions of 1% per year over the next two decades. And that's what our latest paper shows, that we've got uh, uh, almost the identical effect that we had predicted uh, 20 years ago. So let me stop there in case there are any questions on any of that. Thank you. So thinking about projects out here for students, um, at, there's, this is just such an incredibly rich set of studies that you yeah. offered us. Um, and you are presenting them to us you know, whole cloth, like they're done. Um, could you tell us about some of the challenges going in as you were formulating research questions yeah. or figuring out what variables were actually skewing the data? Yeah. Because I think that's one of the things that policy labs in particular grapple with is in, on such a short timeline, how do we figure out what variables to start with? Yeah, yeah and, and indeed, um, all of these cases uh, have different origins in some way. So the abortion thing, we were trying to figure out why did crime fall? Uh, and I had seen a talk that's got me thinking about uh, the impact of legalized abortion. Other cases, you know, people call me up and they say, you know, if you look at this, uh, I'm the death penalty uh, cases. Um, and, um, and, and of course, sometimes you're, you're limited by what data is available to you. So sometimes I go searching for data and sometimes the data is what, what drives you. So, if you look at um, the way you know social science has changed over the last 20 years, when, when I was getting my PhD, people were always motivated by what is the question that I'm most interested in answering. Today, it's often what is the data that's available to me that will best help me to identify. So I, I just mentioned this paper that looked at women who went to an abortion clinic and they were either turned away based on the gestation age of the pregnancy. And um, that's, that's the sort of discontinuity that a lot of people are constantly looking for. Um, and so in a sense now, modern social science often is driven not by questions that are of interest to the researcher, but data and these sort of natural experiments that are out there in the world. That's a neat thing because you can answer some of these questions better with the natural experiment. On the other hand, if you're a litigator, you don't have that luxury. You have to go with what you've got. And, and so this has created all sorts of interesting tensions in, in the law uh, for how we treat uh, data. And the courts are not always particularly adept at, at treating uh, data. But um, you know, the, the, the one thing uh, that, that I do find is um, that there, there is more and more data available. And, and so, for example, many journals now, for example, the American Economic Association, as recorded in the American Economic Review, require data and computer files for every published paper. So it becomes a very rich source for people that 
you know, creating data can take a long time. And if you're on some sort of policy limitation, it's nice to get somebody's data set and do some of the things that Brock was suggesting, you know, maybe look at it in a slightly different way, tweak it to see how robust it is. And that can be a useful shortcut to saying something interesting with, with data. And even, even the, the assault weapon ban piece that I put together, I did because uh, that, was, that was driven by litigation. We didn't have good evidence on the impact of the federal assault weapon ban. It's a tricky nut to crack because we don't have the obvious treatment and control. But collecting data and looking at it, I, I actually got a, uh, an undergraduate uh, who was interested in that topic to help me uh, put the, the data together, and it ended up with a New York Times publication. So uh, that, was, that was helpful. And, and, it, and it's definitely had impact in, in a number of uh, Second Amendment cases throughout the country. Yeah? You mentioned you would flat up algorithms for the synthetic control. I was wondering, like, how do you choose which algorithm to trust? Yeah, and, and so the nice thing about uh, uh, synthetic controls is it was created by uh, a guy named Abadi at Harvard, an economist. And you know he uh, essentially generated the um, uh, statistical package that will implement the synthetic control. So you can just go to Stata or other canned statistical packages and just run the synthetic control uh, uh, algorithm that he developed. The, you do have to choose what explanatory variables you want to enter into the system. Uh, but once you do that, uh, you can simply follow that protocol. Now, I did mention that a number of researchers, including some here in the economics department, are, are trying to see if they can tweak the synthetic controls approach to make it even better. So there's a lot of machine learning going on to see uh, are, there, are there different and better ways to specify that algorithm. So it is an active area of research. And uh, in, in a sense, it's nice for me because when the new protocol comes out, I can just run the new protocol and get a new, uh, new publication. Hopefully it will supplement and, and expand what I've found in the past, but if it doesn't, uh, you know, all we really care about is what is the truth. Yeah, so like, since like we don't really understand the mechanism of the algorithms, it, it, is it, to you, is it like a black box approach? And if so, like how, how can we, make sure that this result is trustworthy. Yeah. Yeah, and so the, the algorithm uh, is really trying to do two things. One is to fit the pattern of crime in the pre-adoption period, and you can see based on the graph how well it did that. But it's also trying to take into effect um, how closely the states match up with those explanatory variables. So things like, you know, income and incarceration rates could be explanatory variables. And uh, it's, it's doing a, a, a sort of a maximum likelihood uh, estimation that is going to uh, uh, you know, fit the data as well as possible, subject to the constraint of being relatively close on these other explanatory variables. But again, that's, that's a subject of, of active research to see if they can make it better and, and even more, um, you know, open to to clear understanding. Um, I'm curious how you pick which countries or jurisdictions to compare with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're looking at different states, and sometimes you're looking at different countries, and just point how you factor that in. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I. I'm shameless. I go wherever the data will allow me to go. Uh, and so, for example, I, I haven't shown it here, but uh, some people took our computer programs and just tried to run our analysis on abortion and crime, which was done on American states, uh, linking arrest rates for 15-year-olds uh, you know, with abortion rates of people for, uh, in that state 15 years earlier. Uh, and they took our methodology and applied it to Europe, and they found the same result, that uh, wherever the abortion rates were higher, you know, 15 to 20 years later, you see uh, crime dropping. So, so the, the tools can often be expanded into different domains, but if you're doing 
uh, a sort of panel data analysis that requires both data over time and also different jurisdictions that you can compare. So we did 50 states over the period in our latest paper from 1985 to 2014, and this other paper in Europe looked across uh, all the European nations over a 25-year period. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, I think it seems skeptical to me how you can, what is the causation or the nexus between abortion rates lower, uh, increasing and 15 years later having that have a 1.5% impact on crime? It seems like there's so many extraneous factors, like how do you take account of these variables across that time frame on yep. something as diverse as crime rates? Um, and then... It also, secondly, I, I would presume also that, and perhaps I may, I may be wrong in presuming this, but in the sense of this correlation between abortion and crime, how can two different countries have such a close correlation of 1.5% decrease in crime? Uh, okay, so let, let me say a couple of things. There are a lot of studies like this one, which was done... Uh, following 220 uh, children born, 1961 to 1963, two women twice denied abortion rates for the same pregnancy. It used to be in Europe, you could get a pregnancy and convince a magistrate that you should be allowed to have it. So these women were twice denied, and they compared how those siblings of those children that were born uh, <coughs> did compared to the, the children born after twice being denied, and they found that um, being born in an unwanted pregnancy was an enormous risk factor for uh, poor mental health. Uh, they were five to six times as likely to suffer from alcoholism or drug addiction, far more likely to be sentenced to prison. So that's sort of micro data trying to establish the nexus. What we did was, again, this sort of statewide analysis. And what we find is that the abortion rates... Uh, correlate very highly with the drop in crime over the ensuing years. And just let me show you some graphs as well. Uh, so this was actually, uh, the economists took our data and they put a nice heading on it they called Grow and Behold. And you see that essentially low abortion states and high abortion states have very similar patterns of crime until right here. And that's when you would expect the abortion impact to start coming in. And then you see convergence over time. But what is most interesting in some ways is this. What we did was we looked at arrest rates for 15-year-olds. And then we could look back at what was the abortion rate 15 years earlier in that state. And we found the higher it was, the greater the drop in arrest rates for 15-year-olds. And then you, you look at 16-year-olds, and we look back 16 years. So we were controlling for whatever was happening, let's say, in New York in 2000, we controlled for. But we found that the drop in crime was greater for the cohorts that had the higher abortion rates, and that worked across all 50 states. So th that is pretty strong and compelling evidence, much better than simply... The graph I showed you, which was correlational, linking the, the drop in crime to the abortion rate for the particular age group within a state over this long period of time. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned a few areas for empirical research and public policy, right? From your own experience, uh, you talked about the death penalty, about right to carry. Um, other areas that come to mind are tax policy or gerrymandering too has seen a lot of empirical attention from yeah. economists and political scientists. Um, I was wondering if you could touch on maybe some other areas that you see emerging as important applications of empirical studies to important policy questions. Yeah, yeah. You know, it really is almost endless if you, if you sit down and think about it. Uh, almost every big issue of public policy has an underlying empirical dimension to it. And, uh, and, and so, again, I was reading Atkins versus Virginia, this, the death penalty case, and then they said, uh, you know, unless the death penalty measurably contributes to 
uh, deterrence or retribution. So I just started thinking about, well, how would we try to measure to see whether it does contribute in a measurable fashion? Uh, and this is true for everything from minimum wage laws. Uh, my beloved, uh, now deceased colleague, uh, uh, Alan Kruger, along with David Carter Berkeley, did some amazing work uh, looking at the impact of, of changes in minimum wage laws. And indeed, just even in the last uh, few, few weeks, you heard, you've heard Trump talk about, you know, and low-wage workers are experiencing increasing wages. It's all because of me. Uh, some very interesting work just done in the last couple of weeks showed that the low-wage workers were getting an increase if they lived in the states that had just raised their minimum wage. And of course, Trump has fought raising minimum wages, so the idea that he could take credit for this um, but, but that's the sort of thing, almost any public policy statement uh, or issue does have some important underpinnings that empirical evaluation can illuminate. And that, that's what I'm constantly trying to do because, believe me, the special interests will lie unbelievably if they think they can get away with it. And I never thought that the president would, would lie so unabashedly about things that we know to be true. So, for example, saying that the murder rate is the highest in 47 years when we know it's just not even close. Um, but that's why we need people who are looking at the data in a sophisticated way and can bring the truth forward. Uh, were there any notable outliers uh, for either the abortion data or the gun control data? And if there were, how did you account for them? How did you explain them? Yeah, uh, yeah that's an interesting question. Uh, let me show you some outliers on the gun case in the synthetic controls analysis. Oh, what about this here? So here is some variation in the states according to the synthetic controls estimate. And so you know the median or the mean effect is about basically you know one percent a year increase in violent crime uh, or a little bit higher uh, if you adopt the right to carry law. And you do see some uh, variation, uh, some at the high end, some at the low end. And I think this goes to the question that we were talking about later. I'm much more dubious that Utah really got a big drop in crime or that Mississippi or Florida got that big an increase. Uh, I think there is some noise in the synthetic control estimate for the reasons that we were talking about earlier. And therefore, I tend to think that the median or modal estimate is sort of, you know, winnowing out some of the noise in those estimates. Um, but, but that's what you know, additional research is trying to focus on, to see, is it really the case that Utah is an outlier and there was something really good going on for Utah? Uh, or is that merely, you know, there's, there's some element of the Utah crime rate that deviates from, from what we would have expected and the synthetic control isn't giving us a good good estimate. On the abortion and crime uh, uh, scenario, I think that the, the, the data was, was largely uh, consistent across the board in the sense that certainly there were no outliers that removing them changed the, uh, the outcomes. Uh, but I don't have the same nice graph here. It might be something that, that's worth doing just to be able to answer that question a little more accurately. But, but it is something that you're always interested about because you can learn things from situations like this sometimes. Uh, sometimes all you learn is, 
there's noise in your data and you're getting some outlier effects and just focus on what the, the mean effects are which sort of eliminate some of the noise. Uh, but, but sometimes you learn, oh yeah, something really unusual happened here and you want to look at that. So for example, uh, just a couple of illustrations of this point. Um, uh, when the World Trade Center bombing occurred, you suddenly got this enormous spike in the New York murder rate. And so if you don't take out the World Trade Center, uh, it looks like you know, something really bad was happening at, at that moment, and that can throw off your estimates. Another thing, the, the first empirical project I, I ever did was looking at how um, ideology of states or political orientation of states influence the male-female earnings differential. And I got really weird results uh, for the District of Columbia because in every state in the country, the more you worked, the more you got paid, um, uh, you know, just in terms of a, a statistical relationship, hours is, was associated with annual income. But in the District of Columbia, it went the other way. I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I investigated more, and it turned out that federal workers at that time were working 37.5 hours per week, while most people working full-time were working 40 hours a week, but the federal workers were getting paid more. So it flipped the direction of what's the impact of working more hours. So your point is a great one. When you see an outlier, it's an opportunity for, for learning more. Hmm. Yeah? Do you have any advice, like, I'm not a student here, I'm actually like a person doing this kind of work. Do you have any advice for like presenting this sort of data to people that don't understand stats and like the best way to get them to like, yeah. like okay, I get it. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, you have to be, uh, and, and, and indeed it's, it's one of the first things I said when I said uh, I liked one element of, the, uh, of that first study, which was in the Wall Street Journal, but I hated in terms of what they, meant, uh, what they were trying to say, but it did have a simplicity about it. And that's one of the things that I try to do is first figure out what's true and then try to find ways to come up with maybe nice graphics that seem to, to support the truth. And so even though the graphics sometimes um, really are not strongly predictive in their own right, if, if you can simplify things that, that people can absorb more readily, that helps. And, you know, I would never try to do a, a talk of this nature in a public setting uh, because I'm, I'm giving too much. Uh, you, you really want to have a much more limited set of topics if you're trying to convince someone on something because, you, you know, this stuff is complicated and it really can overwhelm people, but if, if you can target your audience to say, you know, today we're interested in what's the impact of minimum wages on earnings um, and come up with some of the, the nice studies and, and Cord and Kruger did some wonderful work where they, they looked at you know, McDonald's uh, on either side of you know, the state border where one state elevated the, uh, the minimum wage and the other state didn't. So you can try to make it both transparent for people, but also um, you know, economically sound in the analysis, and, and that's often the best way. Can I um, just thank you back on that same question? Because one of the things that I think is super fascinating about this work is that he has published so many op-eds. And so he's got this public, you know, very thoughtful presentation side to this very complex data behind it. And so on your note, and I hope everybody will do this, Go do a bit of research and read his op-eds, and then link back to the studies, and you'll see what he means by how he's able to take really complex data and distill it into these very you know, simple points. They don't come across as simplistic in any way, um, but they are definitely distilled. Yeah, yeah. Although I should say that uh, in, in certain circles, you know, my name is Bud, but uh, that's another guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.